free the Angola 2000. And today you have a community of activists that at their own expense are visiting you from New Orleans, Louisiana. And it is important to recognize at their own expense. Um, I want to start off by saying a few words about one of the warriors we know because he brought home a political prisoner we all love, Lynn Stewart. These are <coughs> readings to you from Ralph Pointer of the New Abolitionist Movement and the Lynn Stewart Organization and the Black is Back <coughs> Coalition. And what he says is many of us, many people around the country, think of slavery as being in the past. But when Lynn Stewart was asked about the coming of the fascist state, she replied, for a certain segment of our population, the fascist state has never left. Amen. Amen. Today, we hope to take a closer look at action to end this slave state that still exists in Louisiana. The recent fight pardon me, to abolish Louisiana's Jim Crow 10-2 law and free all of those who were wrongly convicted under it has uncovered injustice that goes far beyond Louisiana. Contrary to what we've all been taught, the 13th Amendment did not end slavery but permits it as a result of criminal conviction. Mm -hmm. Slavery was thus shifted from the plantation to the penitentiary. Mm -hmm. From the South to nationwide with new slave masters to replace the old, i.e. the US government and Wall Street corporations. It spawned a century and a half of propaganda painting African Americans as criminals and the number one target of the criminal justice system. This racism allows corporations like McDonald's, Exxon, Victoria's Secret, United Airlines, Walmart, Target, and more than 50 others to make super profits by exploiting slave labor and then extending that exploitation over the rest of the working class. It's not about crime, it's about profit. No matter what color you are, if you are a convict, you are a slave. All this is hidden out in the open, in plain sight of everyone, virtually unchallenged because of the stigma of crime. It is proof of the fact that race is how America does class and that America has never done away with slavery as well as why deep racism persists. The people of Louisiana have challenged that racism and slavery by, vote out, by voting out the 10-2 law in last November's election. Louisiana's ruling class has responded by calling for a constitutional convention in 2020. Their intent is undoubtedly to reinstate the 10-2 law in a form that can't be outvoted by the people. 2,000 plus incarcerated citizens weren't grandfathered into the change requiring 12 jurors to convict. Hence, the struggle continues as unanimous is not enough. We, the American people, must support the people of Louisiana in this fight for freedom and bring the innocent home. <laughs> and of course, we're going to introduce the sister who started all this trouble in the first place. And I want to give you a little background on her. Sister Belinda Parker Brown was born on October 5th, 1959 in New Orleans, Louisiana, to Matthew and Celestine Parker. She and her family later relocated to Michigan, where she lived for 30 years. She has been a longtime activist, advocate for people's rights, and a community organizer. One could say that Belinda has been in the people business for most of her life. 
Many of you, I want to throw in a little aside here, who are familiar with the struggle of brother and reverend Edward Pinkney should know that this is, uh, he was her mentor. She is mentored by Reverend Edward Pinkney, who is still fighting for uh, housing against Whirlpool and for good water and against the subprime wall and everything else. The police murders, or I should say murders by the uh, Army of Occupation in Benton Harbor, um, Michigan. So her three basic beliefs are respect for every individual, strive for excellence spiritually and educationally, live for the Lord, and serve your community. Linda is an educator, researcher, life specialist, community organizer, motivational speaker who spent the majority of her career enhancing the potential of others. Diverse audiences have benefited greatly and responded enthusiastically to Mrs. Brown's wealth of experiences. Along with her partner in crime, Reverend Carl Brown, they have seven children and has been married for 39 years. And she is the president and chief executive officer of the organization that is bringing this struggle before you today. It's a bipartisan social justice organization whose mission is to champion the protection of human rights, including the civil, constitutional, and societal rights that are all too commonly trampled in today's world. The Louisiana United International speaks for the person or group that cannot speak for themselves and has a proven track record all across the state of Louisiana. She also is a co-host of a talk show, A Force for Justice, and is a nationally recognized advocate for helping people in need to have their voice heard. She strives to be that voice, that beacon, and hopes that her actions and her life is a beacon for all. I want to go to the uh, biography of our co-conspirator over there in the cause for justice and struggle in Louisiana, Brother Lloyd Kelly, uh, based in New Orleans, Louisiana. Lloyd Kelly is the executive director of Helping Ourselves Make Economic Strides, called Homes Incorporated. He believes that by developing affordable housing, we empower communities economically, politically, and socially. Partnering with Louisiana United is currently focusing on the Unanimous Is Not Enough campaign. The campaign's mission is to secure the freedom of thousands of Louisiana prison inmates who were convicted by a split jury verdict and were not grandfathered in, as we mentioned before. For years, Mr. Kelly has been on the front lines developing policies for issues affecting the black community in the African American community, criminal justice reform, and he's also been involved in the struggle for access to technology for the black community. And without further ado, I am Betty Davis. I am a longtime advocate for community control of schools. I'm a member of the New Abolitionist Movement, as I think I said before, and also a recent member of the Black is Back Coalition for Justice. We would appreciate if you would Google that group, and if you're interested in joining us, we're interested in joining you. Uh, and we also know I'm a member of the Lynn Stewart Organization, which is alive and well, and still supporting the freedom of our political prisoners, upon whom all the space that we exercise in terms of liberty, justice, and equality, we are standing on. It is those political prisoners that have given us the space that we have today. And that's why we have the freedom, and we have to free them all. So without further ado, Sister Belinda Parker, you are welcome to me. Wow. Thank you, Sister Betty. Um, sit back, relax because this is probably going to be a presentation that you have not experienced. And I know I have been to quite a few of the panel that have happened here in this building throughout this event. And I have met some very powerful, powerful people and leaders that are definitely, without a doubt, moving and shaking this entire country. So with that said, I want you to relax because we, this is an action. Panel. I have some things, some very tangible things for you all to do in here today, okay? 
But I want to tell you how I met Sister Betty. The first time I met this woman, she was getting off the plane or were, were driving up to a hotel that she had came on her own, used her own money to come to Louisiana to meet me and the rest of my um, criminal justice task force team, along with Mr. Kelly and many, many others, and Reverend Pickney and um, Chairman O'Malley. I mean, people just came from all over, California, New York. Um, um, we had people there from Texas, um, Mississippi. People came from all over to um, be a part of our um, mission to announce this unanimous is not enough. Um, I don't, this is not about me. I can stand here and tell you a whole lot of stories about me, what motivated me and where my passion, the reason why I'm so passionate about the work that I'm doing. Because I want you to know without a doubt, this is about all of us. This is the one that we all can unite on, without a doubt. That would bring us all together. Because I know we can win this one. We have the proof that we can win. But it's gonna take all of us together to do this. It started in Louisiana and we can finish it there. And that is what I want you to know. You know, um, Louisiana should be ashamed of itself. <laughs> and we want the whole world to know that the criminal justice system in the state of Louisiana is a disgrace. It's a disaster. And we know why. That's the reason why we're here in New York. That's the reason why we came to the left forum. Because we feel like this is a, a breeding ground to get this word spread across the entire country about what's happening to the people in the state of Louisiana. Katrina told the real story about how bad people was treated there. I'm not coming to you with a speech. I want you to know the truth, the real truth about what's really going on. Because so goes Louisiana with the corrupt criminal justice system, so goes the world. It's not just happening there, it's happening all over our entire country. But Louisiana took the lead. They was known as having more people incarcerated than anywhere else in the world. And again, we know why. They were known, uh, the, the, the prison, Angola, was known as the most bloodiest prison and the worst prison in the entire country. It was a mockery because whenever the slaves would cry out and say, I want to go back home, they said, okay, you're going home. So they, that's the reason how, and that's how Angola got its name. People are being lynched in the courtroom, literally lynched. Because if they're not shooting them down in the back cold-blooded, they're lynching them in the courtroom. And most of you, this is a national known story. You know this person, Betty, Alfred Wood Fox. It was called the Angola Three. Now, the warden, Burl Kane of Angola Prison, said that he don't care about the fact, and these are his words. He said, the case against the solidarity does not depend on their innocence, though even if the Angola Three were murderers, subjecting them to decay, um, decades of solidarity, so solidarity, confinement, or what the state called close closed sales restriction would still count in a merciless 
and inhumane. He don't care about that because the fact that they're um, that they were held in solidarity, solidarity for solitary, yeah, solitary, solitary confinement. confinement. The fact that they were held there for almost 40 years, 41 years, don't have anything to do with their innocence. But the reason why, do, do anybody in here know this story about the Angola Three? Do you know the reason why they put them in solitary confinement for over 41 years? They were organizing in the prison. This is his exact words. Black Panthers. He said that, I would still keep them in confinement. I know that it is that there's that I know that they are still practicing black pantheism. And I still would not want him working. I mean, I, I would not want them walking around in my prison because I know that they would organize the young inmates. This man told this story. So Girl Kane is no longer the warden in Angola. And because of the work of this organization, he's up under a comprehensive investigation for running a hellhole, corrupt prison that were torturing people for no reason. I want you all to know here today that this is real. Uh, Mr. Kelly, would you come up? I want to tell y'all briefly how I met this man. Because this is what's going to get you this. fired up. This is what's going to get you fired up because if it happened to this man, it can happen to anyone in this room. And this is the reason why we're saying that unanimous is not enough for them to hold these people hostage, kidnapped inside of the God-forsaken hellhole jails and prisons across the state of Louisiana. I met Mr. Kelly. Okay, it should be up here. Oh, we need the password. Do you have the password on the sheet? I know where, I know where it is in another room. Do you want me to go get it? Um, I think so, we had it up here. Okay. I know it was posted in a couple. Right. Room. Okay, go get it real quick. Okay, while she's going to go get that for us, and we're going to get our PowerPoint up, but I'm going to lead right into uh, one of the um, main reasons why we're saying that unanimous is not enough. And when I met Mr. Kelly, um, um, and what really got him fired up to be um, a part of this great work that we're doing. Um, he has a story, but we have a story that we want to share what really got us um, moving in the right direction to get these people free. It actually started unanimous. It's not, it, it, it led to us being here today. Absolutely. And that is the story of Mr. Earl Victor. Earl and Tanya. Earl and Tanya Victor. And I just want to, the story is a long, horrific, it's a horrifying story, but the story is so outrageous. It's, outrageous. it's so sickening. It's so, um, I can't even describe the words that, um, that would, for Wi-Fi, I don't know if this will work on the computer, but Thank the you. password is that right there. Okay, so all right, put the password in. I don't know if it's the same for the computer. Wi-Fi. Um, Patrina. Patrina. Carl, can you go and find Patrina, please? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You don't want to try the password? Uh, yeah, the, for the Wi-Fi. Yeah, the, 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 right. It's her computer, and I think yeah. it might be. Yeah. Not on the Sorry. It's not on the Thought I could help. Okay, go tell the story. Start soon. Okay. All right. You know how technology is, and, yes, and then we. But oh, okay. There, it's asking for the password yeah. of, of, of the um, the university. Um, I said grab my notes. I'm so sorry. My notes there. Okay, Thank real you. quick. So sorry. Thank Mr. You. Earl and Tanya Victor 
were prominent business owners in their community. It was called St. John the Baptist Parish. Has anybody ever heard of St. John the Baptist Parish, Louisiana, except for you three over there? <laughs> <laughs> Has anybody ever heard of, okay, one person. Now I want you to keep in mind every single thing that you would think of some place called St. John the Baptist Parish, Louisiana, backwater, swamp land, is exactly what we're talking about. Go ahead, Belinda. They were prominent. This man was on his way to becoming a multi-millionaire. He was already a multi-millionaire. Right, he was already a multi-millionaire, but he was getting ready to, and St. John the Baptist set right outside of New Orleans. It's like a corridor right outside of New Orleans where New Orleans is congested. So if you're out there in this area and you're gonna build homes for, um, um, he had sold 23 million dollar homes for people. 23 to This is the place that you would want to be right outside the city. Beautiful. Mr. Victor's um, first wife died, and they had six, six children. He married his second wife that had five children, four children, right. And in that union, they had two more children. All of these children were boys. They had a total of 13. They had a total of 13 boys. And Mr. Victor's boys were, um, I mean, just very well-mannered children. I mean, they were just well-educated because, you know, he was making sure that his boys were going to be the legacy. Can I mean, the legacy that he leaves. Right. Okay. Um, one of Mr. Victor's, Mr. Victor homeschooled all of his children. All of their lives, he homeschooled them. So when they, when Emmanuel got to the age to go to college, he wanted to be an architect. So he applied to uh, Louisiana State LSU in their architecture department. It was LSU or Southern. At any rate, you know, when you go to apply to architecture school, they want to see your portfolio. So again, homeschooled. He sends his portfolio in. They call him back to ask, can they use his work as their flyer, their material, their promotional material? That's how good Mr. Victor was. With his and, and, and Mr. Victor was, he also sco scored a 35% on his SAT. Mr. Victor was, I mean, brilliant. Is brilliant. He is brilliant. And he was the one that wrote the le legislation or the language that for became ten the 10-2 that we were successful in getting the law changed. And I know Betty read you the history of that, but that was an unconstitutional racist Jim Crow law that was schemed up to literally snatch people off the street, especially black people. In 1880. And put them in prison and make slaves out of them. Because of the exception to the 13th Amendment of the United States. Is there anyone here that is unclear on what the exception to the 13th Amendment is? I'm a chair. Okay. okay. The U.S. Constitution, 13th Amendment, is the amendment that freed the slaves. So it says that there shall be no slavery in the United States except for people that are incarcerated. And I'd like to ask you this one little question that nobody ever puts together. And that's what I do, I sit around and try and put things together, connect dots. So if one third, one out of three, one, two, three, black men go to prison between 17 and 35, is that by coincidence or is that by design? Because when I'm in prison, a bunch of corporations get free labor. And I can make some sheets, and I can do some railroad ties, and I can make little chips for these computers, and I get about six cents an hour, and y'all buy those computers for about $900 a piece. That's what's happening with the exception to the 13th Amendment. We know for a fact that people can work for four cents a day and make someone billionaires inside. And everybody knows it. Everybody's been talking about it. But the fact of the matter is that the federal government pays people 
for you to be incarcerated, it probably costs the taxpayers about $40,000 a year per inmate, per year. In order for them to receive that federal government money, they have to have a 97% occupancy. So what they do is trade people around like cattle. If you don't have your 97%, well, I got three people that I can send you so you can make your quota and get your money. And then when my quota is down, we can switch them around. So in other words, when people tell you that they get, it, they get in the system and it's hell getting out, once you get in the system, you become a, invis you become a member. That's all. Okay, that's DOC now. Can you tell about Mr. This yeah, is no, Mr. Big, the first page. Right there. This one? Mm -hmm. Right. And I want you to click on the music. Um, this is a song that Mr. Victor wrote. Okay, the music, we have technical difficulties. But that's Mr. Would Victor's house right there, that he built, him and his boys. I am so dying for her to hurry up and get to the story because y'all okay. will be as angry as I am every time I, every time we talk about this, I just get pissed off okay. Okay. again. So what I do, I just clear the girl. Okay. Okay, this is Mr. Victor's house, and this was um, one of the, um, this was his house, and all in that <coughs> corridor on that street, where um, he had built like about 80 homes similar to this. What Mr. Victor had did since he was so brilliant, um, we, you know, the, anybody know the New Orleans Saints? Anybody heard of the Saints? Sure. New Orleans Saints? Okay, where 18 of these Saints players were millionaires. They became partners with Mr. Victor. After his first wife died, he invested her, you know, she died of cancer, and he would have paid anything to keep his wife alive. But he invested his money in land. So he bought like a thousand acres of land and he went and negotiated with these Saints players to become partners with him to build homes for them. And he was on his way to building a script mall that would actually open up the economic development for a black community. It was a $56 million deal, and that's going to be very important. In, in about two minutes, that's going to be very important. Go ahead. So, Mr. Victor had a tragedy. And they took Mr. Victor's tragedy and made it a nightmare. You see the young boy with the big cheesy smile back there? This one here. His name is M.L. He had been suffering from asthma since he was born. But was These undiagnosed. are the children. These undiagnosed. are the four boys of his second wife. Undiagnosed. Undiagnosed. Right? It was undiagnosed. That's very important in the story. Very, very, very important. They took this man's tra tragedy and made it a nightmare, people, because he was arrested and charged with the murder or the death of his child. He and, he and Tommy were. Wait a minute, hold up. Mr. Victor was not even home, he was at his office when his wife called and was saying that the child was having difficult breathing. He tells her, well, give him some water. You know, you're trying to get him, you know, put some water on him, calm him, you know, get him, you know, cool down. Maybe he's hyperventilating or whatever. She tried those things. She called him back, said, well, honey, I think you need to come on home. We need to rush him to the hospital. He said, well, go ahead, you know, get him prepared. I'm on my way. I'll be there in less than five minutes. He's flying down the highway to get to the house. He gets home. He realized that there was nothing he could do. The child was gasping for breath. They put the child in the car, rush him to the hospital, still alive, get to the hospital, and here they go. Well, anybody ever been to the emergency room and they ask you all these questions? You know, where's your medical insurance card? You know, sign these documents. 
you know, you got to um, um, give us a, a authorization to do this, to do that. Mr. Victor said, whatever you have to do, see to my child now, because I will take responsibility. Whatever you have to do. He didn't say, I'll take responsibility. He said, and this is I'll be responsible. No, he says in the record, I'm responsible. Go ahead. I'm responsible, which is different than I'll be responsible. He said, I'm responsible. Go ahead. Absolutely. Now, guess what? The child dies. And that term is misinterpreted. The child dies. And before they can even have a death determination, they arrest Mr. Victor right there at the hospital. Oh my God. So y'all understand the coroner has not even ruled on what the cause of death is, but Mr. and Mrs. Victor are arrested on first degree murder charges. Yes, ma'am. Now we want interaction. You got a question? Go ahead. Yeah, Real quick. Um, actually, it's kind of getting to me what, where I come from, like what you're just saying. A lot of child died, like what you're saying. They ask questions and show them. They said, if they don't happen, the children will die. So they have to have the money, have what they need, but they to treat the children. If they don't happen, the children do die. So from where I come from. And in this case, like, right, he died. So, okay. Like, it was. No death determination. Mr. Victor get arrested at the at the hospital. Immediately they arrest him and take him to jail and charge him. What well, was the first, first charge? The first degree murder. First degree murder. Okay. Now, long story short, we got to mind this up. Mr. Victor, he beats it. A judge rules. A judge rules said that there was no evidence evidence of a crime of a being committed, of a, of a homicide, so none whatsoever. Homicide. So the judge quashed the case, dismissed it, threw it out. But by this time, Mr. Victor has spent millions of dollars fighting this case, had probably made about over 100 court appearances. His children had been snatched away from him by child protection services. Mm. Yeah. They had adopted his kids off and he did two babies. Did they not died. even know where his son was buried. Mm. So Mr. Victor and his wife filed a civil suit. Civil suit for five hundred million dollars. Something like that. It's between a hundred and five hundred. Okay, here we go. I got it right here. In this civil suit, Mr. Victor named them all. He names them all. Because the, the very next day, the bank calls for all of his loans, take all of his money out the bank. Okay, this is St. John the Baptist Parish in Louisiana. Okay. And they can do stuff like that there. Don't go. <laughs> All right. So he sues the bank. He sues the Child Protective Services. And Mr. Victor is free. So they call for a meeting with Mr. Victor and tells him, if you don't drop this, we're sending you to Angola for the rest of your life. And Mr. Victor is doing life in Angola for a crime he did not commit. They gave him life and gave his wife 40 years. Now listen, people. Listen. Interaction. Come on. What you got to say, baby? A question. So the, the common material that would send him to jail. There's no court proceedings. They just oh, no, 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 wait a minute. Good question. Good. Question. This man went to Angola before he was even convicted of anything. But what they did was run the charges back. 
on. Instead of first degree murder, they charged him with second degree murder, went to another judge, and got her to sign off on it. Now, Which, just to the judge. Oh, oh, yeah. Hold on. Hold on, because I get to tell that part. The judge's name is Mary Hotard Becknell. Keep the, keep, remember that name. Let's all say it together. Mary Hotard Becknell. Go ahead, Bernie. The judge was the wife. No, hold on, hold on. Remember she said Mr. Victor was extremely successful real estate developer? No, Mr. Victor was the number one real, uh, real estate developer in St. John the Baptist Parish. Go ahead and tell him, William. Tell him. And the judge. Guess who's number two? His wife. Husband. His the son. judge's husband was number two. Is number two. Is the number two real estate developer in St. John the Baptist Parish, Louisiana. And this judge did not believe that she had a conflict of interest and refused to recuse herself. She okay. was the one that sentenced Mr. Victor to life in prison and gave his wife. Now listen, by this time I'm telling you Mr. Victor is broke now. He didn't join up with LUI. And the reason why we're telling the story is because I was there for the whole 10 days of the trial. Mr. Okay. Kelly was there. Now this is the part you got to get to your question. We got Mr. Victor an attorney that was willing to take his case after all the attorneys had just robbed him of his money. Because now I'm going to the governor, I'm going to all of the legislation, I'm meeting with everybody, telling them that we need help with Mr. Victor's case. Because this man is innocent. Guess what they told me? They said, remember, well, they're going to get him. He's going to prison. Do you know who they do? He messing with? So the attorney that did agree to go on Mr. Victor's case, he gets to the courthouse the morning of the trial. The judge tells him, if you're not ready to go to trial, I, I advise you to not even to recuse, she to recuse yourself and not even put your uh, motion in to enroll. Immediately, that would be ineffective counsel for him because he ain't never met Mr. Victor. To lose his he voice. only came on my word. So Mr. Kelly was with me. Guess who the judge? No, 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 no. That part I'm telling. <laughs> no, 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 no. Okay. So what happened was uh, Mr. Victor and I had I had never heard of Mr. Victor until six o'clock that morning. She calls me and says, "Would you go to court with me?" And one of the things that she has left out of this story that is so very important about LUI and how it really got involved is this woman by herself pretty much organized the community to ultimately get rid of the par okay we don't have counties like y'all have we have parishes so she got rid of the parish coroner she got rid of the parish district attorney and the sheriff is on his way to jail as we speak Ooh, yes all corrupt thank you melinda parker brown so when you talk about so when you talk about lui and the work that we've done that's the work that we do Anyway, I'm thinking she, we're going to the federal courthouse to get Walter Reed, the, 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 the DA at the time, our, our district attorney. She says, no, we're going to St. John the Baptist Parish. <laughs> okay, where's that? Because I've only been in Louisiana about six months. Uh, I said, where's that? She said, she told me, I said, okay, it's a murder trial. Oh, we get there, lawyer has been dropped. So I'm that guy that thinks quickly on his feet. And I just said, okay, fine, we, we can't argue over spilled milk. So, voir dire, everyone know what voir dire is? Yes. That's when they start picking a jury. I start writing questions to Mr. Victor, ask, because he's representing himself now. So I'm like, ask him this question. Ask this question. Okay, he said this, and, and Mr. when he took the first one, he looked at me like, who the hell are you? I've never seen you before, but I'm handing to him. 10.30 comes. Judge calls a recess. And she gives us 15 minutes. Well, I take 20 because, you know, CP time. And I was smoking. So I come back about five minutes, um, about, about five minutes late, and I'm walking to my seat. And the judge says, Mr. Washington, keep walking to my seat. Mr. Washington, keep 
walked into the seat. Finally, I sit down, and the bailiff taps me on the shoulder and says, the judge is speaking to you. And I said, oh, no, my name is not Mr. Washington. I promise you, this is what she said. It doesn't matter. And I said, well, my name is Mr. Kelly. And she said, well, Mr. Kelly, I'm assigning you to assist Mr. Victor with his case. Do I have lawyer written on my chest? I do not know the man. I'm, first of all, I'm not supposed, that's not supposed to happen. It's just not. She assigned me to assist him. At that moment, that's when I became passionate about Errol and Tanya Victor because we knew what time it was. We knew what time it was. And every bad thing that you could think of that could possibly happen, it probably did during that trial. And this woman's about to lose her mind if we don't wrap it up. So that is the story of Errol and Tanya. Oh, one quick other thing. Belinda, let me go through this real fast. Mr. Victor, she told you earlier that Mr. Victor is extremely brilliant. Well, Mr. Victor didn't take it sitting down. He went to Angola. But he went to Angola's library and started doing his research. And he's the one that came up with the concept of 10-2. Mr. Victor came up with that concept, reached out to wait, us. Wait, before you get to that point. Uh -uh. The reason why he came up with that concept is because Mr. Victor's jury there you go, tell came me. out with a three to nine verdict. And the court got excited. And by the way, I almost went to jail that day. Yeah. And many other Because days. the judge wanted to put a gag order on the media. She didn't want no media in the courtroom. Now, I'm a court watcher, OK, by registration certified court watch. That's what I do. She tells me that I would not be allowed back in the courtroom. I told her. I, I stood up. I'm like, we're in St. John the Baptist Parish. We're the going to court the belongs to the people. And if you think you're going to put me out this courtroom, I'm fit to go to jail. Here, Mr. Kelly, here go my purse, my keys. Call my husband and tell him I'm fit to go to jail. Come and get I'm me. I'm like, like, they're really going to let me make a phone call, but go ahead. <laughs> the point is, listen, people, we're not making this up. We're not. OK? No, 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 no. This I happened for real. So Mr. Victor Jury came out with the decision three to, three to nine. Now, three to nine is automatically a hung jury. Mr. Victor and his wife had to go home. The judge get mad. She stands up on the bench, hit the gavel, and forced them to go back in there and tell them they better come back out with a decision. Guess what they came back out with? Ten two. Ten two. The 10 2. Mr. Victor was convicted up under the 10 2 split jury verdict that is only two states in the whole country that did that. And Louisiana took the lead. That's why we're telling you people, we know why. So Mr. Victor goes to prison. He's brilliant. He was the ones that studied, I mean, he studied the law. He wrote the language for the, for the, for the Amendment 2 to be passed back in November of 2018, saying that it was a racist, unconstitutional Jim Crow law and that they schemed it up. Can you, at this point, for just a second, can we, can you come up and talk about, um, is that Mimi? Yes. Hey, Mimi. <laughs> can you come up and talk about the, the 13th Amendment and, and all of that? I have to say, you don't have a clue. I am so honored. I am so honored. This sister is on the front lines every day. And we think we know what it means to be on the front lines. Tammany Parish, Louisiana. I'll just start with her son. This is just common occurrence. Her son is picked up. He's arrested in a prayer test. And he's incarcerated. And where is he put into? Has anybody ever heard of a squirrel cage? Squirrel cage. A squirrel cage is a three by six foot 
animal cage, a three by six foot cage, where people in Louisiana have been kept in solitary or incarcerated just in general. Her son is 6'4", weighs 285 pounds. There's an indefinite time that you are put in the squirrel cage. Louisiana has just seeded, I have to say, the highest rate of incarceration in the country to <laughs> Oklahoma. Sorry, sis, you're second. Exactly. But it's the highest. We did that, we did that. And I don't want to repeat, I'm sorry I came late, but I do want to say so why no, I came late. Fault. It wasn't entirely my fault, but there is something else which really goes to this, and we give feedback in the 10 for 2 and the 13th Amendment. I had just come from a memorial service for Leilene Polanco. Leilene Polanco was a trans woman who got in an altercation with a backward reactionary cab driver. She was then arrested for misdemeanor assault. Put in Rikers Island, this was in April, early April, held on $500 bail. I mean, all of this means something. Misdemeanor assault means nothing. 500 day dollar bail means nothing if you ain't got it and you've got a system that is disproportionately putting on bail on people who do not have it. And that's one of the critical things we have to work against, the elimination of that bail system, which is strictly a system of impoverishment. Nothing else, it's about poor people. If you are arrested for aggressive begging, which means that you are what? You are homeless, that's mm -hmm. all it means, right. and maybe panhandling. Do you know what you need to get out? You need a $125 surcharge, which is put on the system, an economic fee in order to get out for panhandling as a homeless person. All right. It's amazing. You know, I was carrying my, my little African-American annotated by Gloria Brown Marshall, who was a wonderful instructor and theoretician. She read her books, brilliant woman, teaches at John Jay College. Carrying my little constitution around. And it's annoying. It's annoying. It's all these big, wordy things. And then you get to the 13th Amendment. And the 13th Amendment is exactly one sentence. What did the 13th Amendment presumably do? Free slaves. Free slaves. But within one darn sentence, you think it would be longer? You think it would be more meaty, more substantive? How many bills, how many pieces of legislation have you ever looked at that are verbose? So I know it's been said, but I want to say it again. And I want my students to be sure they write this part down. Okay. This is the critical thing. Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except, this isn't my politics, <laughs> this is the framers. What could they have been thinking? Except as a punishment for crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. 1865, there wasn't a mass incarceration. There wasn't a mass system of jailing, etc., for African Americans. Well, we know why. Obviously, they were dispersed and they were chattel amongst the plantations notwithstanding up south, the north as well. But listen to that. I mean, it's in the first five words, <laughs> except. So what were they doing? What the heck was slavery? It was an economic system. Yes. And then it was a system when you treat people as chattel and economics, you have to control them. Well, they left that to the plantations at that juncture when it was 
formally institutionally eradicated the plantation system, which had had much to do with the contention with industrialization from the north and a different mechanism for production. Well, what did they do? They needed two things. They needed to deal with a reserve army of labor who was still the backbone of the South. Mm, there it is. And they were going to do what? They were going to develop every single one of the Jim Crow laws. Oh, how clever capitalist entrepreneurialism is. The Jim Crow laws weren't initially as a mechanism of social control for arrested population. That's there too. But it was specifically and demonstratively to take the African ancestry labor and harness it. Because what was the penalty in almost every single case as the economic system of the South fell apart post-slavery? It still had migrant workers, etc. But it fell apart essentially in that systemic way, the plantation structure. Aside from Angola, which is on a million acres, that Angola prison farm, it More still than. is the plantation. It hasn't changed. And if people don't know or have never seen it, do you know it has its own banks, its own schools? It's a small city, not so small. But we'll get to that in a minute. But I just want to specify that the evolution of the system of mass incarceration comes from this permission to re-harness and effectively use as chattel black labor. And how do you do that? You develop every kind of, we understand, Jim Crow law. Five people hanging out together, spitting on a sidewalk, alleged disrespect, all coming out of kind of white supremacist concepts. So you begin to now amass a body of labor that feeds into, not just in the South, and not just the Angola prison farms, but all over the country, a way of putting together black bodies with de minimis, mm, concocted wow. laws, Jim Crow laws, but our own laws now. Mm. The laws that put our Latina trans sister into Rikers, where she died. All of it, it is based on, and this is the ideological framework. We never, in actuality, accept it's typical of America. We're so good in capitalism. We're all about branding. We're all about the fraud of labels. So we abolished slavery, except that we invented a system of laws that was capable of incarcerating people into the development of the system of mass incarceration. And of course, we know, but sometimes the numbers are staggering. Thank you. We have a system of involuntary slavery, involuntary servitude, which persists 154 years later. And it is the essential loophole that shifted the practice to US prisons. Mm. And I don't know how much more time you want to take. Please. Well, can, I just, I, yeah. can I ask a question real quick? But is there anybody in this room that does not understand what she said and the ramifications of what she just shared with us? Please, this is the time to say, you know, I'm kind of slow. I don't get it. Because I will do that. When I understand, I will ask you. So please. I just want to confirm and say, and that's what they're doing in New York City right now with the MTA. They're going to confirm that they're going to have a nice youth population in jail because they're saying okay. we're going to really pay for our system. If you walk through the journey without paying, you're going to be I just want to say two more things before I believe I see back to my sister. And that is, <laughs> Lupe, in what you're saying, I'm a legal aid lawyer for 35 years. Okay. Who do we put in prison? Who's in Rikers Island? The overwhelming number of the arrests continue to be, notwithstanding de Blasio stop and frisk, misdemeanor marijuana arrests, which are easy as punch for the cops, and it continues unabated, and it's racially based in the extreme. 
That's absolutely. Essentially, the That's numbers crazy. of arrests and who is populating <coughs> the Rikers Island jail, which of course should be closed immediately. But I also wanted just to, to really segue back into you. In Angola, 2,000 people, and then there's so much to be said in the, but it's more important to listen to my comrades here. In Angola, 2,000 people, mm -hmm. 2,000 men Actually, have been that, given. That's, those are just the people that we have vetted. Our organization I was going to get to that. Those, right? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. have been, that's why I'm going to let you take it in a minute. But I just want to segue back. As a result of the 10-2 ruling, mm -hmm. and you got that. Say that that means what the 10-2 ruling is, because I'm not sure it's always clear. You're supposed to have a unanimous jury to be able to convict somebody of life for life imprisonment. And almost every state does. Again, we have issues with Oklahoma and Louisiana, et cetera. Nevertheless, and in Louisiana, they didn't have. They had, you could have two people, and it was a very convenient way of saying we're not even having all white juries. We'll have two people of color on the jury, and they will be the ones who will vote against the conviction, but it doesn't matter because all you need is nine to vote for life imprisonment. So it went to the Supreme Court, aside from local demonstrations and stuff, it went to the Supreme Court. Hey, that means a lot, right? And the Supreme Court ruled it's unconstitutional. But of course, what they never ruled is that it's retroactive. But they didn't have to. And that's the struggle. So there are at least 2,000 people which have been vetted by this extraordinary organization that have been convicted under an unconstitutional law as upheld by even the Supreme Court of the US. 2,000 on this jury, which is supposed to be the essence of the promise of democracy and due process. And it is our job to support these champions of social activism whose son does wind up getting put in a squirrel cage, who give all of themselves in a brutal and vicious state to make sure that to begin with, the 2,000 people that are being held under this unconstitutional law are let the hell out. And one good thing, damn Burl Kane, who's for decades been the head of Angola prison and the Atlantic magazine and these liberal magazines had things about how wonderful Beryl Kane is because he brought religion to, to these poor people who were doing life in jail. And what did he bring? The work ethic. The work ethic. And Atlantic magazine has a whole damn video on how wonderful it is because it gives them something to do. Damn you, while well, Burl Kane now, finally after decades, and even being extolled as this plantation overseer, he's the great savior. He brought the work ethic to men trapped under unconstitutional laws of white supremacy. So Burl Kane now, been indicted, right on, and it's really the kind of work that they've done. Yes, the sheriff, the coroner, the DA, and the damn Burl Kane, who's ruled over Angola Prison Farm for decades. Thank you, man. Safe way, as they say. God.